families. Families from Adam to Abraham. Families of Ishmael, Keturah, Isaac, Seir, Edom, Israel, Hezron, Jermiel, Caleb, David, Solomon, and Jeconiah, as Ezra reassures the remnant. And Paul speaks on wrath and righteousness to the Romans. Today on 3 and 1, as we consider 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 3 and Romans chapter 1. Well, we finished reading two books of the Bible last time, the book of 2 Kings and the book of Acts. So today we start two new books of the Bible, the book of 1 Chronicles and the book of Romans. The book of 1 Chronicles, many believe, was written by Ezra as he led a remnant to return to Jerusalem after the exile that we read about last time at the end of 2 Kings. 70 years in captivity in Babylon and a remnant returns to rebuild and restore to rebuild the temple and to restore worship in the temple. And in order to reassure the remnant, Ezra wrote the books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles. He wanted to reassure them that they were on the right track, that they were doing the right thing in the right way. And so he gave them the rich history of worship in the temple, going all the way back to Adam. (laughs) I mean, way to be thorough, Ezra. But there was another reason Ezra had to be incredibly detailed in these genealogies. Remember, there were certain families that were allowed to do certain things in the tabernacle and then subsequently in the temple. And there were stiff penalties if anyone from any other family tried to do it. So in order to establish who's who then and now, Ezra wrote what we read today. And don't worry. These genealogies continue all the way up through chapter 9. Now, before you get bored and just skim all of this, think, this is, this is an ancient historical document written hundreds, written thousands of years ago to reassure real people returning home after exile in another country for a very long time, many seeing Jerusalem for the very first time. And they needed to know exactly what they were doing and why they were doing it. And this first and second Chronicles was a part of that. I have a distinct memory of exploring an old, rundown, abandoned house in the woods when I was a kid. And inside we found these old books. I mean, they seemed ancient to me. And the thought gripped me that these were written by real people so, so, so long ago, and they were written at the end of the 1800s. And I was wondering what what their lives were like so long ago. And then a little later on, I went to a coin show, and I found some coins and some paper currency from the 1700s. And again, I'm wondering, what were their lives like? One of the items that I found was an IOU from before we even had paper currency in our country. And it was intricate, it was beautiful, and it had three real signatures on it. What were their lives like? And then in seventh grade on a student exchange, I remember going to England and seeing gravestones from the 1200s, gravestones from the 1400s. And again, I wondered, what were their lives like? And then today we read an ancient historical document dating back 2,400 years, I mean, 24 centuries, chronicling the lives of people in families dating back uh, all the way to Adam. And I wonder, what were their lives like? What an adventure it is to read God's word. So persevere. Resist the temptation to skim. There are details given in these first nine chapters that will really help you to understand not only what we've read, but also what we're about to read. And I encourage you, as you read each name, think of those names like I did as a kid, looking at those signatures from the 1700s. These were real people from really long ago with real lives and real families and real adventures, all woven into the grand plan of redemption just like you. Hey, do you think that someone centuries from now will read your name somewhere and do the same thing that we're doing today, wondering what were their lives like? Okay, just a thought. Let's jump into what we read today in the New Testament as we started the book of Romans. We just finished the book of Acts. 
And what an exceptional experience to read through how God made many martyrs. Remember what that word martyrs means? It means men or women full of the Holy Spirit in their lives, living their lives in such a way that not even death was a deterrent. It's where we get the word witnesses in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be martyrs to me, witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and at the ends of the earth. So the book of Acts is really the acts of the Holy Spirit through men, through women who were made martyrs. And one of these men was the Apostle Paul, who started out as Saul, an enemy of the church. But God knocked him off his proverbial high horse, and he flipped the script, and he called him into the ministry. So Saul, who once tried to destroy the church of God, started to be transformed by the Holy Spirit of God into Paul, who chose rather to build up the church of God. And he did this through his missionary journeys, 14,000 miles of preaching, planting, pastoring, and persecution. 14,000 miles without the benefit of modern transportation. Now, not all of his ministry was done face-to-face on his missionary journeys. Some of his most impactful ministry came in the form of writing letters. And we have many of them included for us in what we know as the New Testament. There's Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus and Philemon. And there's a healthy debate on the book of Hebrews. But we have at least 13 of the 27 New Testament books of the Bible penned by the Apostle Paul. That's pretty awesome. I mean, one who admittedly previously endeavored to destroy the church of God became a man of God, a man who devoted the rest of his life to building up the church of God. And one of the letters that he used to build up the church of God is the one that we started today, the book of Romans. Listen to the first seven verses once again as the Apostle Paul sets the stage introducing himself, his purpose, and the planned destination of this incredible epistle. He started out this way. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Caesar Nero was in Rome at the time that Romans was written. A madman who dipped Christians in candle wax and lit their heads on fire to light his garden parties, shouting to them, how do you like being the light of the world now? I mean, Caesar Nero was in Rome, who would place bloody lamb skins on believers and throw them to the wolves and say, where is your good shepherd now? I mean, Caesar Nero was in Rome. To all in Rome who were loved by God, but, but yet there were also one to four million other people in Rome at this time. And Paul would go on to say that God has his permission by any means necessary to get him to Rome. Why? So that he can preach the gospel in Rome. And Paul knew that the gospel is the power of God. And if he can just get the power of God into that city, if he could just get the gospel into that massive city, God by his power would do the rest. Like the opposite of dropping a bomb. 
but much more powerful. Instead of death, there would be life, life eternal, and it would spread from one sinner saved to the next as their hearts overflow with contagious gratefulness for his grace. So, since Paul is no longer moved by the threat of persecution, since Paul has already said that all he wants to do with the remainder of his God-given life was to complete the task that God had given him, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace, he was ready to preach the gospel in Rome. So, listen to verses 15 and 16 of Romans chapter 1. Paul said, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The gospel of God's grace in which a righteousness from God, of God, is revealed. A righteousness that is from faith to faith. And it is this gospel of God's grace, God's righteousness at Christ's expense, God's righteousness that is received by faith, that is described in detail, in power, in the book that is before us today. The book that we started today, the book of Romans. The book of Romans has been called the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. In it, Paul preaches, Paul testifies in a very ordered yet powerful way, the gospel of God's grace, God's righteousness received by grace through faith, God's righteousness at Christ's expense received by grace through faith. Now, one particular preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, spent 12 years in a weekly study working his way through the book of Romans. And we will be reading it through in 16 days. But that's what's so awesome and amazing about the gospel. You could understand it in 30 seconds and then continue to study it for 30 years without ever wringing out all of the richness. Now, wrath and righteousness is what we're going to read about in the book of Romans. Written about with Holy Spirit-inspired order, intricacy, and power. Wrath and and righteousness. How can sinful man be saved by a holy God? How can a holy God look at sinful man without consuming sin in that man and still remain holy? Wrath and righteousness. How can the two be reconciled without God compromising his character? Wrath and righteousness written about in the incredible, God-given, Holy Spirit-inspired, Paul-penned book of Romans that is all about Jesus, the Christ, in whom on the cross wrath and righteousness were reconciled.